Our first speaker is John Lilic, who is originally from Serbia. Uh, he was, he's like a true crypto OG. Uh, so if you go to major crypto conferences, you'll see his face, uh, because like he's one of the uh, only uh, independent sponsors of big crypto events. He was involved with Bitcoin very early on, uh, then joined Consensus, uh, which is like a major powerhouse in the Ethereum ecosystem, also contributed to, to Polygon and so many other projects. Also, very active angel investor with more than 150 investors in investments or something like that. So, without further ado, I'm inviting you to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. Um, <clears throat> there's some familiar faces here and some new faces. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's spectacular to see um, this type of an event, the quality of this venue here. Um, it's really indicative of a lot of the change that's happening in Serbia, particularly in the uh, in the tech sector. Um, <clears throat> so maybe today, I, I'm sure you guys are going to see a lot of slideshows and um, decks and PDFs, so maybe we'll just have a conversation. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, you can ask at any time. Um, and I was just thinking I could talk a little bit about maybe my personal history, um, talk a little bit about the history of Ethereum as, as I kind of lived it, um, and, and maybe some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the tremendous activity that's happening here in Serbia and Belgrade uh, and, and, and throughout the former Yugoslavia, in fact. Uh, there's great collaboration across the region. Um, likewise, we can talk a little bit about the current state of crypto. Um, I have some investment theses I'd like to share, and then we can just kind of, uh, you know, talk a little bit about some of the exciting innovation that's happening as well. Um, so I guess just as far as like uh, my story, I, I, I was born in Yugoslavia. I was born in Belgrade. Um, and uh, and I spent the first three years of my life here. Um, my father was a was an aerospace engineer, and uh, he was working for Utva at the time. Uh, and we had an apartment in uh, Panchevo, so that's where I'm originally from, I guess. Um, and uh, and my father sort of moved the family to North America to Canada in the early mid '80s. So I I spent my first five, six years in North America and Canada before we moved to the United States, to Seattle. Um, and, you know, along the way, a lot of change was happening in Yugoslavia at the time. Um, and, and of course, of course, there were some great challenges and difficulties. I certainly remember the mid-80s and going into the late 80s. We used to come back uh, every summer. We used to have a summer home in Croatia. Um, and, and as a child growing up here and spending time here, it was wonderful. It was fantastic. Um, but as things started to sort of fall apart um, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, one of the things my father and my mother, um, you know, they were very active in helping people come to Canada at the time, especially a lot of um, my father's colleagues who were also aerospace engineers. And, of course, I heard many things about um, the uh, political challenges here, but I also remember hearing about, like, the... Uh, the monetary system collapsing, which was like a very foreign concept to me, um, given that I was living in Canada and the United States. And the monetary system, or the illusion of the monetary system, seemed very stable to me at the time. Um, and so I thought it was like this very official thing, like how can it be so weird? Um, whereas a lot of the families that were moving to Canada in the early to mid-90s that my that my, my parents were helping immigrate, uh, emigrate, uh, they were talking about things like hyperinflation and, you know, billion dollar dinar notes and sort of like, in addition to um, monetary instability, it was also very difficult to f sort of find reliable data uh, and information about like the state of affairs and what exactly was going on. So reliable economic data, just reliable, you know, data from which you can do your own, let's say, veridical computing and trying to understand exactly what was going on. That was very, very difficult. And so so I remember as a child, um, it's sort of like, you know, the monetary system was not stable and information was hard to gather. And I recall thinking, you know, those are some pretty important components to trying to understand everything that was happening in the, in the former Yugoslavia for me as a child because that was like a major thing in my life at the time. Um, 
And so anyways, uh, uh, fast forward uh, about a decade, I grew up in Seattle. I grew up um, in the suburbs of Seattle. My, my father was uh, hired by Boeing, um, and so we moved to Seattle. Um, and I saw the uh, dot-com boom sort of starting to manifest with my own eyes in, in, in Seattle. And Seattle was really the first place, even before San Francisco and, and some of the things that have happened in Brooklyn and, and really some of the things that are happening now here in Belgrade as well with, like, the tech sector coming in and the startup um, ecosystem beginning to thrive. Um, and so it became clear to me that, uh, you know, tech is kind of like the way to go. Um, I think... I think everybody who's here at this event is uh, following the right trajectory, certainly here in, in Serbia. Um, and it's very interesting to see how quickly things are changing here. It just reminds me a lot of, of what I saw in the early to mid-90s in Seattle as well, growing up. Um, and so anyways, uh, I kind of fumbled through life and uh, my early to mid-20s, um, trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and, uh, and somehow I got into uh, e-commerce and I was tinkering around with uh, basically buying domain names and drop shipping items um, and taking a small margin. And so my advantage was uh, I would be able to process credit card payments on my websites. And then the wholesalers would, the manufacturers would drop ship items and I would sort of like, you know, I was building my online empire. Um, all of that came crashing down, um, well, in addition to Amazon eating the world, uh, but um, I also had tremendous, tremendous banking problems, like in 2011, 2012, um, and I guess in some ways I got canceled like a decade before they started canceling people, um, and this is kind of a funny story that I tell people, but... Um, you know, I, I had an office in London, uh, I had an office in Barcelona as well, and I was drip, drop shipping all sorts of products, generic, for example, gardening products. Um, but the bank thought I was, uh, I was, uh, I was, I was selling uh, sex toys. They thought I was selling dildos. And I said, <laughs> and so on the basis of that, which I wasn't, I said, there's nothing wrong with that, but I wasn't. Um, but on the basis of that, they froze my merchant services account, they froze my bank account, and one of the things I discovered in London is when, when one bank freezes your account, they tell the other banks. And so now the other banks won't let you open a bank account. And like that happened to me in late 2012, early 2013. And it took, and so I had this like little online business. I thought I was doing very well. And then suddenly everything was just completely frozen. And I, and I, and I, and it was, it was based on something that wasn't even true. Um, and so it was a very frustrating experience, um, and that's when I realized that actually, you know, bank accounts and access to financial services, for example, is not necessarily a right. It's not like a human right. It's not, it's a privilege. It's something that, you know, they can take away from you. And so um, my business was totally devastated. They froze my money. It took nine months to get my money back um, while they did their KYC diligence, et cetera, all these sort of investigative uh, uh, procedures that they have to follow. Uh, and, you know, in the panic of all of that, I started looking for alternatives, and that's how I discovered Bitcoin. It was just sort of like tremendous dumb luck, really, in the end. Uh, and so it was an interesting experience because I thought it was like the worst case scenario, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And in the midst of that is when I sort of like was forced to somehow discover Bitcoin uh, because I was forced to confront the fact that... Um, you don't have an inalienable right to transact uh, in the uh, in the existing legacy system, um, which kind of like brought me back to some of the stories I had heard from uh, other families. My parents were helping move to Canada and the United States uh, from Yugoslavia at the time during the war, where you know the right to transact transacting was very hard. It was very difficult to um, do a lot of things, and so it crystallized in my mind that um, it is very important if we're going to uh, make positive constructive change, particularly in emerging economies like here, that we do have systems in place that guarantee the right for everybody to transact um, and, and really, more to the point, do so um, at a global scale. And I think that's one of the interesting things um, we can talk a little bit about here in, 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 the, in the Belgrade, Serbia context, because you've got lots of great startups. Um, you have some pretty good sort of like um, mainstream industrial legacy companies as well. 
but your stock market has virtually zero liquidity. And so I think there's uh, tremendous opportunities here to access these global liquidity pools. Um, we could talk a little bit about that in, in, in a short while. And so anyways, uh, once I discovered Bitcoin, I got um, basically fascinated and totally obsessed. I moved to New York City. I started working at a place called the Bitcoin Center, uh, 40 Broad Street, right next to the New York Stock Exchange. And for most of 2014, I was meeting Wall Street people and I was trying to learn about the financial system and I was trying to defend Bitcoin uh, because at the time, back then, I wasn't like a distinguished keynote speaker. I was kind of like a shady guy who was using Bitcoin and like, what is, you know, and it was like very dangerous and it was like, uh, in some cases, um, it, it wasn't the case that you could say that you're a Bitcoiner and somehow have a warm reaction from people. It was quite, uh, you know, you, you, you're like a guerrilla, you know, warrior or something. You had to like lay low and be very careful and not talk about it too much. So being there at the Bitcoin Center on Wall Street and talking about it very openly in front of Wall Street people um, was a very contentious experience. But um, I think it just further cemented that, you know, really when you get into the nitty gritty of the financial system, it's really important to have something like Bitcoin um, as a pressure release valve, as the other side of, of the system, so to speak, uh, when, when, when things get too uh, unsustainable, sort of like what we're seeing these days. Um, and so anyways, uh, the Bitcoin Center at that time was like a magnet for all sorts of, well, people who would later become very successful. Brian Armstrong was there, Jesse Powell was there, the CEO of Coinbase and Kraken and others, back when it was just sort of like they had these little startups. Um, and it was a great place to uh, meet new people, and that's where I met a guy named Joe Lubin. Uh, I heard about a project called Ethereum, uh, and ultimately I ended up uh, being one of the first people to start working for a company called Consensus. Um, and, and so Ethereum sort of emerged, and, and really at that time, if we go back, it was sort of like if anyone r was involved in the altcoin market at the time and the Bitcoin ecosystem, you had Bitcoin, and then you had these like weird forks that would emerge. Um, and they would change some attributes associated with the way the network works, and somehow this would kind of gain traction, and now you would have Bitcoin, and you would have this other coin, like Feathercoin. Feathercoin was a proof-of-stake coin. It was basically like Bitcoin, but proof-of-stake, and so transactions happened faster at a lower cost. There was Quark. Quark was one of the first coins, altcoins that I speculated on, and I, and, I, and I actually made some Bitcoin speculating on it. Um, and, uh, and, and again, it was just like a UTXO copy-paste where they would change some attributes. And over time, you had many of these coins that had slightly different uh, features and functionality than Bitcoin, but there was no cohesion. And so generalizing that was one of the great uh, um, challenges of the time that everybody was sort of talking about. And of course, Vitalik came out with a white paper. Vitalik's white paper um, was well written, but it was really Gavin Wood's yellow paper that sort of mathematically described how this system could theoretically work that that really crystallized that Ethereum could actually be real. Um, and so we spent, uh, and, and so at Consensus I spent the next six years um, intensely working on helping build out the Ethereum ecosystem. And along the way I learned some things, which I guess these days, um, you know, it's it's nice to talk about Ethereum honestly uh, because I think we we tend to uh, not critique ourselves very well, um, and so I, I, you know we did initially kind of like um, promise the world we were going to build a, a world computer. Um, turns out we built a global U.S. dollar banking system um, with stable coins and wallets, effectively serving as thin you know, fiat thin end clients, you know. And so now everyone anywhere in the world at virtually no cost can effectively have a U.S. dollar bank account. And that's more or less, and then of course you can engage in some financial activity as well, particularly collateralized lending and borrowing. And that's sort of like what Ethereum has become. Um, but initially we had, we had talked about a uh, world computer and it was funny, I was um, at the, uh, there was an event last night at the Metropole Hotel, and it was uh, the gentleman who's head of Microsoft here in the Balkans, 
gave a really nice talk and he and he was talking about Azure, you know, their cloud and he said this is a world computer, right? And it actually is a world computer and I thought and there's you know there's actually Ethereum nodes running in Azure as well. So all that to say our initial vision, I don't think we realized, um, and 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 largely that's because a lot of the problems that we have to solve in order to realize that vision are very very hard. Um, and so, I think in the beginning we trivialized to a large extent, or perhaps didn't really understand the full scope of the challenge. And so it was easy to say something like Ethereum World Computer, and we're going to have this like unimaginable scaling because we're going to have a thousand and twenty four shards. Um, <laughs> which, you know, we sort of had to reassess and say, well, maybe 64, and then, and then, and then, sometime later, it was like we had to quietly announce maybe one shard. Um, scaling is very, very, very hard, um, and uh, that's sort of one of the one of the challenges. I think I think the other the other challenge has been um, effectively coordinating between um, protocol engineers and the private sector. Um, I often use Definity as an example um, of a foundation that's driving and producing most of the research that then goes out into this protocol. Um, whereas in Ethereum, we sort of once we realized the scale and scope and gravity of the situation, we started pushing out challenges to the private sector, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but but it also does, I think, to to a large extent, explain why we kind of have a little bit of a Frankenstein ecosystem right now where there's like many different approaches. Um, and somehow, hopefully, mashed together, this produces some benefit to the user. Um, but but there's still a long way to go before it's, a, it's an elegant system that, that does resemble a world computer. Um, so I guess that's kind of like my hot take uh, as far as the current state of Ethereum. Um, but, uh, but along the way, so, so going back to my story, along the way, working at Consensus, I met some great people. Um, in 2017, I met a guy here named Mihailo, uh, who was just uh, kind of a lowly researcher, spending all of his time trying to understand Ethereum. And he was publishing some great stuff on Twitter. Uh, I came to Belgrade. I spent quite a bit of time with him. And at the time, he was working on a project called Neth. It was, it was Neth. It was sort of like this Swiss Army approach, Swiss Army knife approach to scaling. Um, and uh, and I and I worked very hard at Consensus at the time to try and get Consensus to basically pick up the project and take it forward, um, which they declined. But Mihailo kept working nonetheless, and ultimately connected with uh, the Matic guys, and they sort of rebranded, and that was the birth of Polygon. And so, I think what's really interesting there is like Polygon is very much a Serbian story. It's very much a Belgrade story, um, and. And so, you know, going back to my original point where there's this kind of like tremendous opportunity to solve or work towards solving some of these big challenges like scaling, um, indeed, uh, you know, a guy from Belgrade who was just obsessed with Ethereum and spent a lot of time trying to learn as much as he could became the driving force, which, which then, you know, produced some spectacular results for this ecosystem. And so I feel like I'm seeing that generally speaking, um, happening all over the place here in Belgrade and, and indeed throughout um, former Yugosla Yugoslavia, uh, our, our friends and colleagues in Zagreb and Croatia and Slovenia. I mean, there's tremendous innovation I everywhere. And I think it goes back to some of the points I was making earlier where um, young people in particular, but all generations here, really understand the importance of having sound money, having um, reliable information, democratizing access to both. Um, and I think, it, you know, what we're seeing now is a type of turbocharging of, of this particular sector of the economy uh, because those things are in place. And so, you know, whether it's a polygon or, of course, since we've seen other tremendous uh, startups emerge from this ecosystem, Tenderly comes to mind and there's many others, um, I think this trend bodes very well for this region, and I, I expect I expect to see continued growth. Um, it's really important to support the ecosystem accordingly. Um, I think there's really good policies in place, uh, particularly teaching young children how to code as a mandatory requirement in school, uh, I think is a very smart approach. Um, 
I was, uh, I forgot the gentleman's name yesterday from the government. He was talking about some of the government policies here and um, lots of support uh, and sensible policies, I think, to help foster particularly the data science and AI growth that we're seeing as well. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and, then, and then frankly speaking, I think just, uh, you know, just kind of like the work ethic of people in this region is very strong as well. And so um, very, very hard working, talented young people everywhere. So yeah, I met Mahilo, spent some time here, Polygon launched. We had a pretty wild couple of years. Um, Polygon is now on its way to try to re-architect its token and really drive zero knowledge innovation, um, which is another really hard set of problems. I think it's important to uh, temper our expectations a little bit. Like I expect us to be working on these problems for decades to come. Like I don't think um, we're going to see uh, some kind of silver bullet solution um, anytime soon, but continue, you know, continued progress and innovation um, and step by step, uh, you know, groups like Polygon are in a really good position to help deliver the promise of the world computer, which is something that Ethereum is still working on. Um, what else? Yeah, I think it's also important to talk about Bitcoin, um, particularly in the context of. Serbian corporates. Um, and specifically, there's one strategy I'd like to highlight that I think um, public companies here should consider. Um, it's really just the, the, the micro strategy approach of adopting the Bitcoin standard, um, putting it on your balance sheet, uh, and um, keeping it in reserve. Uh, and I think you'll see lots of um, demand for, uh, I, I mean, liquidity is going to start flowing in because now if I buy stock uh, on the local stock market of a local company, which is on the Bitcoin standard, there's a degree of resilience um, and, and um, attractiveness that's, uh, that's lacking right now, okay? I guess on any given day, the local stock market here, I mean, liquidity is like, you know, the volume is kind of like maybe like, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 euros a day. Um, whereas Bitcoin is doing, you know, tens of billions a day. Um, and so I guess if there's one message, uh, and, and, and we've had lots of interaction and discussion and dialogue with regulators here and uh, the government, et cetera. And I know they're, they're thinking about different ways to um, enhance the stock market here. But I think, I think there's a really simple solution. And of course, there's this digital transformation initiative and all that kind of stuff that's happening. Um, there's even EU investment in trying to make basically a digital stock market emerge from Serbia. But I think just even just a simple strategy of acquiring Bitcoin, putting your, your company on the Bitcoin standard, um, and then communicating out to the market will drive a tremendous amount of investment and liquidity into this stock market. Um, and and so that's kind of like what I like to call real simple thinking. Um, there's lots of, like I said, uh, more complicated approaches to try to uh, create this dynamic digital marketplace here, which I think is fine. Uh, but if you had Serbian companies at a discount, you could buy their stock and that stock entitles you to a share of their Bitcoin, um, that that is something that I think would turbocharge the stock market here very very quickly. Um, anyway, just a just a silly idea I had, um, and so <coughs> you know going forward, I think uh, I think I think the the ecosystem here has a tremendous opportunity. Um, I think the government here is working very hard towards creating the right kind of environment. And, uh, you know, it's just a place that's full of talent, uh, very hardworking people. Um, and so I would expect to see continued uh, investment as well. Um, I guess there's a new fund that just launched um, here in uh, here in Belgrade. And there's several others along, uh, you know, coming along the way. Um, but again, one of the things that I would highlight is um, 
and th th this is kind of like almost like a national strategic issue for Serbia, in my opinion. Um, you get these like incredibly talented startups. Um, I, I don't know this to be true exactly for Tenderly, but I'll just use them as an example. Um, so I'm not speaking on their behalf or anything. It's just that all the innovation happens here. Um, they raise a tremendous amount of money. They build an incredible product. And then for them to have their liquidity event, they have to go IPO in America. And so one of the first things they'll do is open up a Delaware C-Corp and either transfer IP or assign IP through some master services agreement and ultimately um, attempt to, you know, succeed by either having subsequent bigger rounds and ultimately going to the public market or whatever the case might be. And generally that happens in America. And so Serbia ends up investing in all of the incubation, right? Like developing the young talent by teaching them how to code in school, investing in IT parks and other infrastructure that allows them to then innovate, create a beautiful startup just so they can then leave. <laughs> because it's hard, to, it's hard to have a liquidity event here, okay? And so I think um, it's very important for us to consider the fact that tokens allow us access into very deep global liquidity pools without necessarily um, having to leave the country. Um, and so this is, this is another opportunity for, um, government here and regulators to really innovate and be at the cutting edge. Um, there's a great example, a uh, good friend of ours, he's actually gonna, gonna be speaking later, his name's Johannes Pfeffer, he's a developer from Germany, former colleague of mine, and he's with a project called Tokenize It, tokenize.it. And so basically the German government has um, created a framework that allows this startup to tokenize a GmbH, which is like a D D D D O O, so so like a corporate, you know, an L L C, a limited liability corporation, and so now you can uh, tokenize equity in a G M B H. Um, you can sell that equity, you can trade that equity. It becomes um, fungible globally. I mean, I guess there's some restrictions, but generally speaking, it's a a very innovative approach, and we're already starting to see tremendous demand from startups uh, for the tokenize it uh, product. Um, and so I think from the Serbian perspective, it's very, very important to, um, without hesitation, um, quickly move towards allowing startups to have the opportunity to tokenize their equity and really go into these global um, liquidity pools without having to immediately start crafting strategies to leave Serbia uh, because their startup has traction and if they want to have a successful exit they need to be in a different jurisdiction. Um, it could be interesting of course to set up subsidiaries in other countries um, but the hub if you will uh, you know if the core of your business of the core of your startup began here there's really no reason why um, silly regulation which otherwise protects a stock market that has virtually zero volume and liquidity is the reason for your startup to have to leave the country um, y you know as you pursue as you pursue future subsequent funding rounds and and, and uh, exit opportunities um, so that's kind of like another I guess hot take that I think um, probably could use a little bit more discussion and momentum here um, there's al already tremendous uh, uh, incentives the government has put forward as far as uh, investors coming here, entrepreneurs coming here, making investments. I guess there's even tax holidays. Um, but I think I think we have to reframe the problem and and really think about it from a liquidity standpoint. Um, existing corporates here, I believe, should go on the Bitcoin standard, and their stock now entitles you to. Um, the Bitcoin and the gains potentially from the Bitcoin that they have in their treasury. And I think that's one major driver of liquidity to this market. Uh, and then of course, allowing startups to tokenize their equity. Um, and, 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 and then you get a situation where very, very quickly um, volume starts to grow and suddenly we have a vibrant, uh, vibrant ecosystem. And I would, I would even go a little bit further and I would say, um, one of the things I learned at Consensus 
uh, one of our core engineering offices was in Romania. Uh, so I feel like Serbia today and broadly the former Yugoslavia, generally speaking, is, is, is kind of like it reminds me of Romania maybe 15, 20 years ago, whether it's Cluj or Bucharest. These were sort of like the Silicon Valley of Eastern Europe. Um, tremendous innovation, great, great talent, similar uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, strong STEM education. I always, I always kind of joke, you know, I grew up with uh, my father Serbian, he was very technical, he was an engineer, and it's kind of like, um, I had no choice but to do my homework, you know, like I had to do very well on my math exam. There was no, like I can talk about my feelings and maybe not do my math homework or my physics homework. It's like, no, no, um, you must do these things. And, and I think, I think, I think broadly speaking that generally tends to pay off. And so very similar culturally in Romania to Serbia. And so they did have tremendous amount of young people who did go through these STEM programs and then later became great software engineers. The guy who wrote the uh, crowd sale contract for the Ethereum uh, uh, token sale uh, is a guy named Marion. He's, he's, uh, he's a Romanian guy, grew up in extreme poverty, uh, went to uh, schools that were like forcing him to learn math and eventually became a software developer and he wrote the crowd sale contract for, for, for Ethereum itself. Um, and so Romania did a tremendous job building up its IT sector, although I, I do think a lot of it in Serbia is trending in this direction, um, went towards the services and consulting side. So basically what we're doing is providing tremendous talent and great services to other companies, uh, you know, in exchange for like uh, good monthly salaries. Um, and, and, and probably I think a big reason for that is because a lot of entrepreneurs realize that, hey, if I build my product out of Romania, it's going to be very hard for me to have a liquidity event. Um, except for the crypto, like Ethereum, early Ethereum developers realize that, well, I, I, can, I can build a product um, and I can actually access very large global liquidity pools. Um, and so Romania had the opportunity, I think, to build a dynamic stock market that sort of hasn't materialized, even though they have a very large IT sector, but that IT sector is primarily doing, well, to a large extent, services. Um, and I think, I think this is like the fundamental strategic kind of decision that Serbia needs to make at this stage. Um, we should endeavor to embrace the importance of liquidity um, and we should endeavor to um, try to bring the liquidity here. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that will, in addition to helping create tremendous opportunities here locally, it will also shift the market towards product development, um, maybe more so than, than services. Um, and ultimately, that's how you build value, and that's, I, I think, how you build the country. Um, <coughs> So anyway, that's kind of like another one of my one of my hot takes. Um, yeah, so here we are today, I guess, in terms of what's happening now in Ethereum that I think is interesting and what's happening in Bitcoin right now that I think is interesting. Um, well, we're at a data science conference, and so data is a um, really important component of Ethereum that uh, is undergoing a rapid transformation right now where projects are emerging that allow for um, unconstrained ownership of data, uh, that allow for, um, <coughs> you know, basically access to uh, well-indexed data that's rich, that's granular, that's uh, easily accessible and allows you to build just about anything in a very short period of time. Um, I think this sort of space is really important and one to keep a close eye on, particularly as the AI advancements move forward, um, both in terms of, well, making sure that the AI isn't lying to you. So contextualized data is going to be very, very important. Contextualized data that you, know, you can reference on-chain and have, um, you, know, you know, like reliably, it's like you can rely on this data and it's provably um, true for whatever purpose you're you're using it or, or, or building on top of it. Um, that's kind of like one really important aspect of it. And there's another project here um, that you'll probably hear about in the next couple of days. And it's sort of like this blockchain wallet that is running um, 
like a, 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 an LLM effectively, wherein you can give the wallet some instructions, like I'd like to send Ether to this address, and before you send, the wallet can talk to you and give you all kinds of important information. Like you're about to send money to a scammer, are you sure you wanna do this? Um, but the thing is, how do you know, and so this is your, as Microsoft says, co-pilot. Um, and, and I think as it relates to the blockchain industry, um, if we're having this conversation a year from now, every single wallet in the blockchain ecosystem will be radically different. It will be this kind of like co-pilot concept where you have a wallet that is intelligent and can give you um, some, some feedback. Um, but in order for you to trust that it's telling you the truth, you're going to need contextualized data. Um, and you're going to need unconstrained ownership of your data um, so that your wallet can tell you something before you engage in a transaction and maybe there's like a green check mark that indicates that in fact it's telling you the truth or it's telling you um, information based on data that you have verified is true. Um, I think, and, and then of course, governance as well. Um, and again, we're talking about like what's really important right now, um, especially if you're trying to make an investment thesis, is whether whether you're trying to build a product or whether you're trying to invest in crypto or whatever. Um, you know, governance and and so DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, maybe are not the most perfect or most elegant examples of governance, but they're certainly much better than. <coughs> a few people running a board and making a decision about a $100 billion startup, you know, and you don't even know if they made that decision, you know, if it's a malfeasant decision, like you don't know if you're being attacked somehow. Of course, I'm talking about the open AI um, incident, where, wherein, wherein um, governance is sort of like controlled by a small number of individuals that has tremendous ramifications. Um, I think, I think Ethereum in particular, as we move into this AI world, um, is is a very elegant solution for trying to manage the governance side of it as well. Um, so, so those are kind of the, the two of the things that I think are really, really important. Contextualized data, veridical um, computing, deriving from contextualized data um, with unconstrained ownership, and governance applied to a lot of this stuff as, as these blockchain wallets radically evolve over the coming year. Um, and then I guess, you know, again, going back to Bitcoin, I think it's really, really important. Sorry, how much time? Huh? A few minutes? Okay, okay. Sorry, I've been, I've been uh, rambling for a while, but hopefully, hopefully it's, a, it's an enlightening conversation. I think the other thing that's really important in terms of now, what's going on right now, is, is, is Bitcoin and, and in particular, um, where we are, um, both in terms of what's happening globally, and and I guess I, this is a common thing that I say often, and my friends hear me say this, but it's like, I didn't get rich by being smart, I got rich by being stupid, okay? And um, we are in the midst of a Bitcoin halving, uh, which is coming in a few months, and so I think it's really, really important for everybody to be aware of what that exactly means, um, particularly as governments continue to print money. Um, and so I think, I think, I think as uh, a lot of the macro trends that we're kind of continuing to see evolve right now um, accelerate, the importance of Bitcoin will be illuminated uh, that much more going forward in the coming years. So I think it's really important um, to keep Bitcoin at the forefront, um, especially as you're developing your investment thesis or your corporate strategy. Um, particularly if you're thinking about liquidity because that's sort of the major issue going forward um, in the macro context is the lack of liquidity. Um, and Bitcoin has proven to be uh, very resilient as far as attracting liquidity. Okay, so anyway, those are some of my thoughts. Maybe, uh, I know I'm running low on time, maybe if there's any questions, we can just have a open dialogue. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I really appreciate your time, so th thank you very much. Otherwise, I'll be around. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you.